Okay, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, we're doing a Behind the Apron series event on behalf of Taste Canada and Canada Beef. I'm super excited to host this event tonight. Uh, we're going to be tackling the topic of food waste and sustainability and use of land in uh, cattle farming. Uh, with me today, I have Will and Casey from First Line Angus. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting their farm and we, for an Instagram takeover for Taste Canada. I had such a great time and so insightful and I learned a lot and I'm happy to have them on tonight to help, help share some of that information that I learned. Uh, and then we also have Dr. Kim Stanford and Dr. Tim McAllister, the hosts of Cows on the Planet with us tonight. Uh, I, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole listening to your podcast uh, earlier today and you know what, it's absolutely phenomenal. At the end, we'll be sure that that we give it a shout out so that people can listen in uh, on some more in-depth topics that you that you handle there. So to start, you know, we're going to start with like the topic of food waste, right? That's kind of one of the first things. And again, you know, we're going to kind of take it at a very high level because I feel like a lot of people know about food waste. They've heard the term food waste, but they don't quite understand exactly what's being done. Uh, and in Canada, you know, one of the fun facts that, that, that I had learned was that, well, not a fun fact, actually a sad fact, is that, uh, you know, in, in 2019, that there was a study that 35.5 metric tons of uh, food waste uh, happened in Canada, and 32% of that was avoidable, uh, and it was like a loss of $39.5 billion, which is like astronomical, and there are a lot of repercussions as a result of food waste. So today we're going to kind of talk about food waste, and again, in uh, cattle farming specifically, uh, what's being done with food waste to help uh, avert that going into landfill. So we're going to start off with like the first topic, which is, which is really what is food waste? Like, so, you know, it, is it garbage? Like, obviously not, you know, is it uh, food that, that, that is still edible? Like what exactly is being fed uh, to cattle? Uh, and uh, Kim, we're going to kind of go to you to maybe start with this, if you could talk a little bit about food waste specifically, and if, you know, this is the type of food that humans can consume. Um, well, just right off the top, it's not, it's not garbage. A lot of um, the food waste would be from processing that would be products that um, are very high in fiber and uh, not, not, cannot be used in the human food, food chain. So it, it's, it's important to, to distinguish between uh, the processing waste and then there's also the waste that after it gets to retail and that's a that's a separate issue that's that's harder to deal with but the the beef industry is really tackling a lot of the that would be the food and sometimes it's called food loss that is from from harvest to to until it gets to until it gets to retail so it's a lot of um things like screenings of, of grain a lot of the grain that cattle are fed there um, it's either not good quality so it'd be feed quality grain or when the grain is being cleaned to make um, flour or just even for for seed then there's a lot of weed seeds and um, other other types of grains that shouldn't be in that um, that that are cleaned out and that that's a product that's called grain screenings that um, then that's fed to cattle and otherwise it would be like there wouldn't be you know people are not going to want to or be able to eat this kind of stuff but it's not it's not garbage it's there are um, specific regulations about what cattle what cattle can be fed so it's all um, it's nutritious but it's it's either high fiber or uh, just just a product that isn't wanted for for use in in a, in a human food like somewhat um, paradoxically <laughs> with with the new push towards uh, high protein meat substitutes um, the plants that are fractionating um, say the pea protein suddenly there's a whole new bunch of byproducts that are being made from this pea protein fractionation that uh, that are being fed to livestock so so even though the plant is is supposedly the marketing for the the is all oh plant protein it is fantastic but um, the whole economy of the plant protein production requires livestock to be using some of these byproducts to make the whole thing economically economically viable so it's it's a it's a nice little 
in, inter interweb of of um, grain growers couldn't survive unless there were livestock producers to eat the um, the the grain that doesn't make the high quality grades that go into go into human food. And maybe that's enough. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but on that point, you know, you talked about you talked about regulation, right? Uh, so, so like, I'm curious, like, what regulation is there, uh, you know, to kind of ensure that the food is of a high quality? Uh, Tim, could you maybe take this one? Sure, Stephen. Thanks. There's uh, like Kim out outlined. There's a number of different. Uh, food waste or byproducts that we could call them. We've got the mainstream ones that are already in place like canola and uh, distillers grains and, and the screen screenings that that Kim outlined that are already you know extensively used within the within the ruminant livestock industry. Uh, and then you have some of your less familiar uh, byproducts that would be coming mainly out of the retailers real retail sector. So uh, vegetables that have been rejected for aesthetic reasons or food that's uh, past ex expiry date. Often those are not entering the food chain, not because they really represent a threat to food safety, but just because they've reached a point of where they're not as desirable by the consumer and the consumers will simply buy fresh material as opposed to uh, the dated material. Now that gets more complicated then because there's a huge variety of, of different food waste that would fall into that category. And actually the feeding of livestock in Canada is very heavily regulated. In order for a feed to be provide it to livestock, it has to be approved under what we call Schedule 4, which is regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. If that food is not listed in that schedule, then you need a special study certificate or a special permission in order to feed that particular food source to livestock. So given that we're you know, looking at utilizing and reducing food waste by increasing its utilization by livestock, it's quite a, a, a task that we have ahead of us to get a approval for all the various potential food waste streams that they could enter the livestock system. But basically, the system in Canada is such that anything that poses any kind of threat from a, a toxicity perspective or could leave residues in the animal or anything like that, that's all part of the very uh, comprehensive evaluation process that anybody would have to go through in order to get that uh, food waste approved for as livestock feed. And if it had any concerns over any of those potential uh, negative outcomes, it would not be approved. And in that case, then that that food waste would be more suitable to going to practices such as as biodigestion or alternatively composting or even potentially a landfill if, if it can't uh, have that upscaling. Really, we're talking about value added uh, by using using those, those food waste products as livestock feed, if that's possible. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. And we're going to get to the topic of landfills in a bit. But first, I want to go to Will and Casey quickly. Uh, so at First Line Angus, you have obviously integrated food waste into your feed. So I'd love to know a little bit more about what you're doing specifically at your farm to help manage food waste. So specifically at our farm, we're using a product from the brewing industry. It's called Brewer's Grain, and it is just spent barley after they have gone through the process of extracting uh, um, what they need to do for, for the beer. So we, we bring in truck loads of around 40 ton at a time from Molson's and Steam Whistle. We have partnerships with them and uh, they come to our farm. They don't make up a total ration. They go into a part of our ration. We are on a TMR or total mixed ration in our herd. And we incorporate approximately two to six pounds per head into that ration. Well, have you always been doing this? Is this something that like started more recently? Is this something that, you know, has been going on and in, in common practice in farms in, in, in the past? Yeah, contrary to uh, belief these days, it's been going on for a long time. And I would say in, into the centuries now, anytime that uh, um, anybody's ever made beer, well, the, buck, the, the byproduct has always gone to, uh, to the animal that was, that was housed uh, or the animals that they own. So it's, it's been going on for a long time. And uh, going back into the 90s, when our, our two fathers were very heavily into the cattle industry and, and feeding cattle, it was always part of the ration as well. So. Cool. And what about the relationship? Like, I'm curious about how does the relationship form? Like, did you first reach out to, to the breweries or do our farmers like, you know, integrating it? Are they reaching out specifically to manufacturers? Do manufacturers come to farmers? Is it a symbiotic relationship. I'd love to know a little more about that. 
Yeah, me and Casey have had it pretty easy because the relationship is already established. But uh, yeah, it takes the farmer going to the the brewery and saying, "Hey, look, I've got uh, I've got capacity to take this. Um, are you able to commit to it?" And it uh, it uh, it works the relationship from there. But we have a broker that we use as well that facilitates that conversation between the brewery and us, and uh, that's how that's how the the process gets started. Cool. And now. Um... You know, I want to kind of talk about obviously. So, like, what happens to food waste, right? Like, if, if it's not used in feeding uh, cattle, what happens? Like, so it ends up in a landfill. Can we talk? Maybe can you talk a little bit more about? And Will and Casey, Tim, Kim, anybody who kind of wants to tackle this one, uh, can we talk about more what happens uh, specifically with the products when they do end up in landfill and what the repercussions are of that? Sure, I, I can talk about that a bit. So. So the food waste that, it, like we said, we mentioned, if it's if it's not deemed as, as being suitable for livestock feed or it can't enter easily enter the, the livestock feed chain, then it en- it can end up in a landfill and and a landfill, uh, you know, it's buried. There's there's criteria in terms of uh, proper sealing in that uh, of a landfill so that you don't have leakage of nutrients from that site or movement into groundwater. Uh, and, and under those conditions, then that material is buried, and that really creates the same anaerobic conditions, the lack of oxygen that's present in the stomach of the cattle. So that's why cattle produce methane is because it's an anaerobic environment. Well, when you cover up that food waste in a landfill, you have the same effect. You exclude the oxygen, you create an anaerobic environment, and there are, are microorganisms in there called methanogens that during the breakdown of that organic matter will produce methane as a byproduct. Now, there are some landfills that attempt to capture that methane uh, as well and use it as an energy source, but that's quite expensive and, and you, you know, you're not driving the same value from that food waste that you would if you upcycled it by using it as feed for livestock. Really interesting, yeah. I'll, I'll um, yeah, go for it, Ken. Sure. Um, well, some of the big landfills are recognized as major emitters of greenhouse gases, so they would be like uh, as big as a like bigger than some of the industries would be the emissions coming from the landfills, and it's it's really a, a lose lose scenario because uh, the wh- whoever the processor is having to pay to have these valuable nutrients put into a landfill where then they're going to cause problems with greenhouse gases. So really, we want to keep as many valuable nutrients out of the landfill as possible and and recycle them, um, preferably into really tasty meat or milk or uh, things like that. And my cat is here and he's not going away. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I actually visited a landfill and there's a very large landfill in Seoul, Korea that they they buried about 30 years ago and they built a park over top of it and they've been extracting methane out of that landfill for over 30 years now and using it in their in the city there in Seoul, Korea. So it's a long term emission source. So on that kind of topic then, you know, like in terms of like diverting and incentivizing, you know, we talk a lot about things like carbon credits, et cetera. Like, what do you kind of see the future being? You know, do you see that maybe playing a role in helping to divert food waste? Well, I think if you look at the whole idea of carbon credits, it's it's really a, a, a method or an economic incentive that recognizes management practices that lower greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to positive outcomes in terms of uh, climate action and clim- and dealing with climate change. So in the case of, if we look at food waste, so, you know, that, that food was produced uh, on land, uh, considerable resources went in to produce that food. And basically, if we throw that into a landfill, all of that investment is, is largely lost. Now, if we take that food waste and we re-divert it as livestock feed, then that means there's a certain portion of land out there that we no longer have to use specifically to produce the livestock feed because now we've offset some of that feed by using food waste. And if we recognize that then, and that that land is now being used for other purposes or can be uh, set aside and, and, and used you know, for preservation purposes as, as a park or whatever uh, type of application you wanna use that land for now that it's been freed up, that represents then something that would offset emissions from that land and could be seen as a carbon credit. So you know, that would be part of the process here is as we look at 
cattle, you know, taking the positive role of utilizing food waste, adding additional value to it, and preventing it from having the emissions that it would have if it simply went into a landfill, then there could be credit given for that management practice and it being recognized uh, in terms of a positive aspect or management practice within the cattle industry. That actually is a good segue into our next topic of sustainability, which is use of land, right? Uh, and we want to kind of delve into the use of land specifically for, for raising cattle. Now, uh, is the land that's raised uh, used to raise cattle also suitable to produce grain or other crops? Because I know that this is a topic that a lot of people ask about. They think that land is being used specifically for cattle that should be diverted into, you know, vegetable crops or whatever it may be or grain. Uh, but is that land actually arable? Tim, I think we're going yeah, to come yeah, back to you for that yeah, one. Sure. Yeah, sure. Two in a row, that's fine. So, um, you know, the, the, the beef production system in Canada is quite unique because it, it consists of both an intensive uh, component, which is related to the feedlots and that that we use where we feed uh, very well-balanced diets. The animals achieve incredible levels of performance and efficiency in terms of feed efficiency and where the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of live weight or per kilogram of beef are amongst the lowest of anywhere in the world. Um, but then on the other side, we have the cow-calf sector, which really is anchored in the extensive rangelands in Canada, utilizing the, the grassland areas and that. And many of those areas are unsuitable for crop production, either because of poor topography or uh, undesirable soil types or lack of moisture, uh, no access to irrigation systems. All of those lands are not really suitable for crop production. And, you know, people who know the history of, of the Canadian prairies know that, you know, in, in the 20s and 30s, we had a huge migration of people and, and settling of, of various areas in the Canadian prairies and many of those grassland ecosystems. And over time, you know, I know like in, in, in our, the ranch that, that Kim has, there were eight families that went, at one time lived on that ranch and now it's down to one. So many of the, the, the uh, settlers and, and people who, who, who uh, uh, had homesteads in those environments learned the hard way that it just simply wasn't suitable for grain production. And, and many of those areas have now reverted back to grasslands and are used for grazing beef cattle. So no, you know, a lot of that land is not suitable for crop production. And then Will and Casey, I want to come to you now. So I want to kind of talk a little bit more about obviously like the, the unique way in which we raise cattle. Uh, you know, do you feel in Canada there's more kind of environmental benefits? Like is Canada a leader uh, in the way that we're raising? And again, like how does that affect uh, your operations? I would say that we're pretty close to being a leader worldwide as far as our, uh, our environmental footprint per animal. Like uh, Dr. McAllister was saying, I think we're around the 11 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of live weight in Canada, which would be about half of the world average. So we are on a world stage doing a, a good job as far as keeping our, our footprint in, in terms of greenhouse gases to a minimum. And I think that contributes to, uh, you know, there is a lot of rangeland in Canada, but 9% of it only supports cattle. So we, we still are um, intensively farming other, other crops, vegetables, grains, um, other things that sequester a lot of carbon um, and, and that that helps us keep our our footprint down on the world stage. In terms of our farm too, um, we we do have to plow occasionally. We, we have to break up the land once in a while and, and that does, you know, we're losing carbon that way, but um, to manage it efficiently, um, cattle in our operation are rotationally grazed they're they're intensively grazed because we don't have the rangeland like they do in western canada but using that management style helps us to maintain our sustainability here on our farm now one of the key terms that i also hear a lot about is biodiversity right and it's stated that cattle can kind of enable or promote biodiversity but like what exactly does that mean um kim can i come to you for that one sure i'll fight to I'll unmute um yeah biodiversity is just it, it's a measure of all the life that is present. So it's, it's everything from the plants, um, the animals, it includes like the soil microbes. It's the whole package of what is alive in that parcel of land. And 
cattle grazing, um, a lot of different plants are, are promoted, different animals can coexist quite nicely, wildlife can coexist quite nicely with, with well-managed grazing in comparison to monoculture cropping where um, biodiversity is, is substantially limited only to maybe the margins of the field, not, not <laughs> right in the field. They're only going to get different plants and different um, um, insects and, and everything just just um, on on the edges sometimes. So uh, yeah, a cattle cattle grazing is definitely a, um, a a big compared to cropping. It's it's really got its advantages for promoting biodiversity, which is something that a lot of people don't think about when when they're thinking about cat cattle farming. But it's it definitely definitely is. Is, is, a, is a benefit. I remember uh, last year I went to meet with uh, Sandra Voss in Frankfurt and you know what, I remember that was kind of one of the big topics that she had taken over this farm that was like no longer arable and by putting cattle on it and raising cattle, I mean you see the ecosystem that's formed now and it was an actually like incredible story, you know, and a really eye-opening one for me. So you're right, like I don't think a lot of people understand that connection. Uh, so on that topic, you know, uh, Tim, like without cattle ranching, would the environment land be able to replenish itself? Well, no, like cattle are a key part of that ecosystem. If you look at, uh, you know, the North American plains, pre-European and, and the role that bison pay, played within those grassland ecosystems, they evolved together over millennia. And, and basically now cattle are replacing uh, bison in, in many of those ecosystems. So they have uh, really important roles in terms of uh, promoting uh, plant productivity in those environments as a result of grazing activity. Those plants are used to being grazed. They're more healthier if they're grazed. Uh, things like removing uh, some of the aftermath in that, reducing the density of aftermath, uh, you know, a lack of grazing uh, will lead to very severe fire conditions that will burn out the soil organic matter, even into a certain depth within the soil. Whereas if you've got grazing animals, you reduce that aftermath and natural wildfires don't burn near as hot as if they do, if, if there isn't uh, grazers on that land. And, and the same can actually apply to even forested land. You know, uh, there's a lot, a big movement now towards uh, thinning forests as a method of fire prevention. So that's coming from the forestry industry as a, a way of trying to reduce the severity of fires. But once they do that, they open up the canopy and allow additional vegetation then to uh, grow on the on the on the forest floor, and that can really act as a source of ignition that can lead to again large fires if that uh, material that's that's growing on the forest floor is not controlled. And so grazing animals can help reduce that uh, potential fuel source as well, and 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 reduce the likelihood of of severe forest fires developing. So they really have a lot of role. That you know they promote diversity in bird life as well, and and that's also based on different levels of of grazing intensity. So some, some birds prefer the grass to be grazed to a short level. Some prefer it if it's a moderate level and some like taller grass. So that's why we also want uh, variation in grazing intensity of cattle within those grassland ecosystems as well, because that can also lead to enhanced biodiversity. I just have to say that's an upcoming podcast that we've got on cows and cows and trees, um, talking about cows for for uh, fire fire suppression, grazing grazing cattle around urban areas in in British Columbia. There are projects going on doing that right now, and yeah. So stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Uh, so Will and Casey, I just want to come back to you now. So like you know, hearing about all of this uh, specifically again, like on your farm, what are you doing to to help ensure sustainable and viable, uh, viable operations for the long term. So again, going back on to what Dr. McAllister was saying about the, um, the grasslands replenishing themselves now, um, our cattle are again intensively grazed and that means that they are, there's a lot of cattle in a small area at a, in a short period of time. So we're moving cattle um, basically every day to a new pasture or a new paddock. And we do this because if we let the grass um, take over too much, we, we get a lot of dead grass that, that chokes out the new vegetation coming up through. So in, in order for us to um, 
keeping from breaking that land because the grass has been choked out or our forage has been choked out. We move these cattle every day. Um, and, and that helps us, um, that helps the grass thicken up essentially. And uh, it, it keeps it growing, it keeps it new, it keeps it uh, viable so that when we reach our 30 day cycle back to that same paddock again, we've got new fresh grass that's, uh, that's uh, um, helping these cattle thrive. So that's, that's how we try to maintain our pasture fields or our grasslands in our area to maintain our sustainability as well. Cool. So now I just want to kind of looking forward, like if we're going to get into like a little bit of like future forecasting, like what do you see on the horizon? I'm going to come to each of you for this. So may I'll start Tim, Tim, and then Will and Casey. Um, so what do you see in the future? Like where, where is this going and what can be done to improve and continue uh, sustainable practices? Tim, we'll start with you. Here we go. I am, I am muted. <laughs> no, I'm not anymore. Um, the thing I can see for um, cattle, cattle um, production is moving more into the post, like the post retail food waste, getting into that, but that's not easy. Um, that's going to take some, some, some other countries are already there, but uh, they've got more, it's like each town would have a centralized food waste sorting depot, and then it, it'll channel um, the food waste where towards like its best instead of things going to the landfill and help to remove some of the plastic packaging which is another issue but i can see um more more post we'll call it um post retail food waste uh, becoming available for for cattle cattle um and other livestock feed or going into biodigestion or going to composting or and, and some of it will undoubtedly have to go to the landfill too, but just better sorting. So less, less ends up in the landfill and more, more of these nutrients can be recycled. Tim? Yeah, I, th I think there's a couple of areas that, that we need to, to focus on. One, one is really rep you know, recognizing the diversity of the beef cattle system and, and the role that it plays in our grassland ecosystems in the cow-calf sector. Most people don't realize that beef producers manage vast tracts of those grasslands in, in a, in, you know, and are stewards of those lands. They really take pride of, in, in the grasslands and they want to manage those ecosystems to their best of their ability. And, and part of that gets back, you know, the COP26 is going on right now. We're hearing about it on the news. Uh, and, and that sequestration and storage of carbon in grasslands is critical in terms of uh, as methods of drawing down the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So that really has global implications. The other is, as well as is a greater recognition, we hear a lot about, you know, the potential elimination of livestock, but we need to think about food security and, and the advantages that occur with integrated crop and livestock systems. And a good example of that would be the manure that we know that produces, and even that has extreme value, you know, as a, as a fertilizer. When we add manure, we know that it improves soil health much more than chemical fertilizer. And that chemical fertilizer is produced through the use of fossil fuels. Uh, so we're offsetting then fossil fuel use if we use uh, manure for that purpose. And we also talked about the role that livestock play in using those byproducts. And you know, most people don't realize, but like our canola industry, the wheat industry, the barley industry in, in Canada, you know, when, whenever those products, canola is crushed for oil, that meal has to have value. If it didn't have value as livestock feed, then the business model for canola production would not work in Canada. Same with the ethanol industry and the production of ethanol from, from grains. And when we look at, at sources like barley and wheat, if we only had barley and wheat producers producing those grains strictly for either production of, of beer or for flour, we wouldn't have very many viable wheat or barley producers left. So we really need to think about the integration between crop and livestock and how those can work together to ensure the food security of humanity. And, and that's where we need to go. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Well, in case you'll turn it over to you. I think from our standpoint as beef producers, I think we're going to have to look at it from the genetic uh, standpoint and, and having more animals on less land. So we're, we're improving our feed efficiency. We're improving the, the amount of, of grassland that um, 
we are raising these beef animals on, but I, I think it has to come down to the, the conversion of feed to meat ratio of our animals to, to make it more, um, well, more sustainable one thing, more viable, but uh, to, make, to make sure that we're improving our, our cattle to, to help meet these goals in the future. And again, like I said, uh, on, our, on the day that you guys came out and met us there on the farm, I, I would like to see more facilitation between the grocery stores and the food processors. Um, having that imperfect food coming back to our farm or, or different farms for those cattle to be able to consume that. Yeah, because at the end of the day, our goal is to deliver a delicious product for, for the consumer. So we're just looking to do that as an economically way as possible, but remain sustainable so that, um, you know, everybody's kind of winning at the end of the day. I think just on that last round of answers, that probably stimulated like 20 other questions that I can get into, but you know, <laughs> for the sake of time, we won't, but uh, you know, we're just going to do one last round. So I just want like, what are your kind of key takeaways? So what do you want people thinking about? What kind of action do you want to see take place? Uh, you know, if people were to kind of walk away from this on the topics again of like use of land, food waste, sustainability and farming, what do you really kind of want people thinking and what, what's your takeaway? So we're going to start again with Kim, Tim, and then we'll end with Will and Casey. Kim? So think, thinking about food waste, um, I think a lot of people assume that cattle are eating like, are, are, shouldn't, are, they're eating food that humans could be eating um, or should be eating. Instead of feeding it to the cattle, it's, we should just be eating it ourselves. But more, 70 to 80% of the feed that cattle are getting is not food that humans could <laughs> could use or would want to use. So uh, I'm, I wouldn't do too well grazing on grass. Like it's just not just not going to sustain me. But um, so it's important to recognize that the role and livestock have always had this role, even like back back from antiquity. Uh, turn turn your cattle into your field after it's you know after you've taken the grain like that that's in the bible so it's been going on forever and it just needs to be recognized the the capturing these nutrients that would otherwise be wasted that that livestock livestock are, are doing Tim, we'll go to you so Stephen, I, I would say there's no perfect food production system. You know, when you, when, when you look across the various ways we produce food, there's, there's always trade-offs. There's always positive and negative aspects of all of these systems. And, and it, you know, I really, I really think I, I'm hoping that consumers will, will take and make the effort to educate themselves with regard to those trade-offs so that when they make food uh, buying decisions, they're making it from a very informed uh, position, and and I think as as Casey pointed out, you know the, the objective of the of the livestock industry or the crop industry is to produce food that people want and and are purchasing because they believe in its its nutritious value, its safety, and and that it's going to basically contribute to a better life uh, for them themselves. But they need to make that from an informed uh, point of view, so that they're considering all of those positive and negative interactions when, when they make their food purchases and they have an appreciation for what the, that uh, implications are of that uh, food purchase, both for you know, society in general and for the livestock producers so that they understand uh, how, that, how they fit and, and what an important role livestock really do play in the food production system. I'll say, Tim, and you know what, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, just in the few years that I've even been now traveling more and visiting farms and getting to know and understand the system, like you really understand how complex a system it is and how interrelated and you know what, it, being informed and making decisions based on, on actual critical information uh, that, that, that is true and scientific is, is incredibly important. So, yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, that, that. that's really the objective of our Cows on the Planet podcast is to try to provide some of that information to consumers. Yeah, which I'm going to give a shout out to in one minute, Tim. So hang in there, but I'm going to go to Will and Casey first to wrap up. Yeah, I think I think we'll just keep the conversation rolling on the on the information. Um, Eighty percent of our business is made up of uh, direct marketing of our product to the consumer, and we really encourage our customers to ask those questions. You know, if they're tough, if they're easy, ask ask everything because we have no problems informing people of 
of how these animals were raised, where they come from, traceability, et cetera. So I think uh, keeping that conversation open, keeping it, uh, keeping that generation of consumers that's been three or four generations removed from the farm, keeping them informed of what we're doing, what practices we're doing and, and how we're doing it. Awesome. So on that note, you know, I will give a shout out. Uh, so Kim and Kim and Tim, uh, Cows on the Planet, uh, again, three episodes that I think really tie in with what we discussed today. If anybody wants to take a little bit of a deeper dive, and I know you're still kind of scratching the surface in the 20 to 30 minutes in your podcast, but uh, specifically, you know, the three that I watched that I found really beneficial were Are, are Cows Wasting Human Food or Eating Food Waste with Dr. Kim Ominski? Uh, how much do cattle contribute to climate change with Dr. Karen Boschman? And are grazing cows harming ecosystems with Tom Lynch Stoughton of the Nature Conservatory of Canada. So again, really interesting and diverse people that you've had on to talk about these topics. And you know what, I think it's a great podcast. So can you just let people know where they can find it, uh, Cows on the Planet? Um, yeah, we're any place, like everybody says on their on, on the radio, any place you find your podcast, you can find, <laughs> can just search for cows on the planet. So we're on Spotify, we're on Apple podcasts, we're on Google pod, podcasts, uh, just, just search for cows on the planet and it, it, it should, should come up. And, and um, yeah, we've got 10 podcasts released and we're planning to release 36. So if there are um, topics that people want to hear, um, please like happy we have a Facebook page set up cows on the planet and Instagram so so we're happy to tackle if people say yeah we want to hear about this so uh, yeah we want feedback to things things we should be talking about things people want to hear about yeah and like Will and Casey pointed out we're not afraid of the tough questions in fact we welcome them so <laughs> we're not we're not shying away from the the sensitive issues we'll say I love it. Don't give too much away. People have to listen in. <laughs> and Will and Casey, how about you guys? So, I mean, I've had the privilege, I have to say, and again, you know, I don't blow smoke. My job is to eat, drink and do these fun things. Right. So uh, when I came to your farm, I was lucky enough to get a bunch of your, uh, your beef and it has been incredible. Like Lauren and I talk about it and we say the flavor is like nothing we've ever tasted. Uh, so for people who do want to purchase from you directly, how can they reach out? How can they do that? Oh, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, so we're located here in Hagersville, just down in uh, southern Ontario. Um, we have started an Instagram page, so it's at First Line Angus. Um, you can reach us there. Um, we're part of lots of uh, purebred sales and stuff as well. So our contact information is kind of easily found, I guess, on the World Wide Web. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate, like, we're, you know, we're just too a young couple that is just trying our best to uh, raise a top quality product and get it out there. So we really appreciate hearing good feedback. Um, like Will said, that's pretty much our, our like 80% of our, it's direct consumers. So um, we're always here to listen and to improve on our products. And um, yeah, so just give us a follow and send us a message and we'll be happy to hook you up. I love it. Amazing. Well, a big thank you to everyone for participating tonight. Again, you know, as we kind of said, we're just really scratching the surface on these topics. And I'm glad that, you know, everybody is open and willing to have the conversations uh, to, you know, if people do want to reach out and, and delve deeper that they can do so. And, uh, and again, just thank you for your time and for sharing all of your knowledge with everyone tonight.